Well, we're in the end of John chapter 12, and uh, John chapter 12, I should tell you, is um, these verses are Jesus' final public teaching. After this, we get four chapters in the upper room, then Gethsemane, then Caiaphas' house, and the trial, then the Via Dolorosa, then the cross, then the empty tomb, then the resurrection appearances. And God willing, that's where we're going to be between now uh, and Father's Day almost every single weekend in our church. I couldn't be more fired up about it. Um, but you got to understand, in the final public teaching, like a coach before the Super Bowl, like a, like a father to his daughter on the day of her wedding, there's just, I want to make sure I got everything said. I, I want to make sure I didn't leave any stone unturned. And so um, the only thing that really ties together Jesus' comments here is final thoughts and, and they seem to kind of, Jesus is usually just going along, but this is kind of a bit of this and a bit of this for the rest uh, of the chapter. And so, um, but let's keep this in mind. Let me put up the theme verse again from uh, the Gospel of John in our series, Authentic Jesus. Uh, here's the theme verse, uh, John chapter 20, verse 20, uh, 31, where he says, but these are written, the things that he wrote in the Gospel of John. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, uh, you may have life in his name. Okay, so in fact, in the previous verse, he had said that all of the books in all the world could not contain all of the things that Jesus said and did. So these are written, so I chose the parts that would help you most figure out that Jesus isn't just a good example and a great healer and an incredible teacher, that Jesus is more than that, he's God. I chose the, oh, he's God passages, and now as he comes to the end, there's just a few things that apparently Christ communicated, kind of like a coach before the Super Bowl game like a father to his daughter on her wedding day. There's just, man, there's just a couple of things I got to make sure I don't forget to say. And so the rest of John chapter 12 has a kind of a, like a potluck, you know, like a little bit of this and a little bit of that and, and good food on the table, but it's kind of hard to thread it all together except to say that these are Jesus' final passionate words to the people that he came uh, initially to reach. So um, I've called this message uh, Counterintuitive Lessons from a King. Yeah, that's the way they've been responding to that title in all of the services. <laughs> so just a little bit on that. Um, uh, when something is intuitive, uh, what we're saying is Something intuitive means directly perceptible, logically connected, obviously related. So if we say, for example, um, hey, 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 son, don't touch the stove. It's hot. If you touch it, you're going to get burned. That's intuitive. Um, or what goes up must, or the early bird catches the... How would you know that coming to the late service? You don't have any idea <laughs> about that. And you say, well, <laughs> those things are all intuitive. They just make sense. Right. So this is counterintuitive. Or it wouldn't seem as though that would be right. But it is. For example, we know in Chicago, uh, from winter driving, if your car starts skidding in one direction, what do you do? You turn the wheel the other way. That's counter. Really, really the other way. It was counterintuitive, or or we would say, uh, for example, another counterintuitive uh, point is is that uh, if you want to lose weight, incredibly, if you want to lose weight, you should eat. I know, right? <laughs> that has not been working here in this instance, but I'm told. <laughs> Aren't we insensitive on Labor Day weekend? <laughs> I am told that six little meals, maybe it's the little part I'm struggling with, but I'm told that six little meals actually kind of, it's just counterintuitive. You wouldn't think, that you think that starving yourself is the best way to lose, but it isn't. It's another counterintuitive lesson is that sometimes the best way to peace 
is not to avoid the conflict, but to go right through it and face it and deal with it. Do you know that? That appeasement is not a strategy, and sometimes you have to face right into the conflict and get after it and get on it and handle it and learn from it and get to the other side of it. All right, well, if you understand that, then you understand counterintuitive, and this message is called Counterintuitive Lessons from a King, where Jesus says stuff like, if you want to live, you got to die. If you want to find your life, you got to lose it to find it. Really? Really? Yeah, it's counterintuitive. And uh, I'm so fired up about these. I was going to get all these together and give them all to you here uh, this weekend, but I got so much out of it and the context that leads up to it that you'll notice that it's a counterintuitive lessons uh, part one. So we're going to have to come back to these next week to finish chapter 12. But if you're ready to jump into John chapter 12, say jump. jump. Verse 9. John chapter 12, verse 9 when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. That was Jesus summa cum laud miracle. Lazarus, come forth! And this dead guy, his friend, actually came uh, back to life. So, verse 10, the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death. As well, as well as who? They're going to kill Jesus and they're going to kill uh, Lazarus. Why would they do that? You don't have to wonder why. Look at verse 11. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So to summarize, they have a, a plan and their method for murder is we're going to kill Jesus, but before we do, we're going to kill his greatest evidence, Lazarus, and we're going to stop all these people from flocking after Jesus Christ. Really? Really? I mean, he just taught the word of God. He just healed and helped and fed people, and you're going to kill him and his friend he raised? Really? Just because your market share is being lost? Just because your popularity polls are falling? Really? You're going to kill them both? Yep. Jot this down. Jealousy drives men to insanity. Jealousy. What, what you have, who you are, why do you... I was, you know, when I'm making these messages for you guys, I'm studying the scriptures and I'm thinking through, how have I seen that? Where have I learned that? And I thought of a... Man, I had lunch with, boy, I'll never forget it now. It was probably 14 or more years ago. And I had lunch with this guy. And uh, he leaned across the table over lunch. And, and he said to me, back then we had about 3,000 people come to the church. And he said, he said well, why do you have 3,000 people coming to hear you? I'm a better preacher than you are. I'm an older man. Why, why do you deserve to have all of these things? Why, why do you get, oh, and you just really, <laughs> I thought to myself, um, maybe because I'm happy when other people do well? And of course, I didn't say that, and he went on to do everything he could to discredit and destroy our ministry, and um, wasn't the first time, wasn't the, hadn't been the last time, um, if you want to understand what's going on here with Jesus, you have to look behind what's driving them is they're jealous. They're jealous. A Kind of a sister to jealousy is, is envy. I'm not even sure those words are entirely different. They overlap in kind of interesting ways. And I have a new friend uh, that I met with uh, some this summer, a guy named Henry Cloud. And I'm kind of excited to be uh, listening to him and learning from him because my mom was a big fan of Henry Cloud. He, uh, with another guy, wrote the book called Boundaries, and he's wrote a book called Necessary Endings. He's just, he loves the Lord. He's a really good guy, and, and, and he was just encouraging me about some things, and we were actually talking about envy, and he said, you know, James, the thing about envy is it's so destructive. He said, envy is, is when envy is going on, there's something in your heart that can only see the good as what you don't have. 
And to hear these religious leaders, I mean, they had a lot of influence. They had a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, opportunity. They, but the, the, they had to destroy uh, what they had in, in reaching out against what they didn't have. When somebody's you know, teaching me something, I'm always wanting to see it in the Word of God. And so as I talked with Henry Cloud about this, he, he said, you know, think about, think about uh, Lucifer, one of the two most important beings that God created. I mean, he had everything in the universe, but what, the good was what he didn't have. He wasn't God. And so he destroyed what he had to try to get what he didn't have because the good is always out there for the envious person. It's never what I have. And so, of course, Lucifer fell and, and became Satan, and that's not going to end until it ends badly in the lake of fire. Envy. And uh, Adam and Eve uh, in the Garden of Eden, uh, same thing. And, and what, uh, I mean, how many people would agree that uh, the Garden of Eden was probably pretty sweet. How many people would trade what you have right now for the Garden of Eden? Just don't even have to tour it. Just how many people would give it up right now? Paradise, how can I get there, right? And, and Adam and Eve, had they pretty much had it. They had what God called paradise and declared to be good. But because of envy, the good wasn't what they had. The good was what they didn't have. And they destroyed what they had. They said, you know what? We don't have that tree, that one tree we got to have that. And they destroyed what they had in trying to get something that they didn't have. Uh, that's what envy does. Uh, it's just a very, very destructive thing. And that's what is going to get Jesus on the cross. Verse 11, John 12, 11. They wanted to put Lazarus to death because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Well, verse 12 then the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. The feast was the Passover. We talked about that last time. Did you know that when the Passover was going on, uh, the population of Jerusalem swelled by 10 times? Normally, there was about 100,000 people in Jerusalem, but during Passover, there was a million people. Just, it's just like being at the Taste of Chicago, right? Where did all these people come from? Wall to wall people. And you can't even move. Imagine if in your city, whatever campus you're listening to this message on, imagine in Niles or in Crystal Lake or in Aurora or in Rolling Meadows or in Elgin or wherever, imagine if the population of the city swelled by 10 times the number of people. That's how many people were here in John 12, 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. This is what we call a Palm Sunday. And this is the Sunday morning after the Saturday night where he was anointed. And on Sunday morning, uh, he's coming into the city from uh, Bethany, about two miles away. And uh, it's hard for us to appreciate maybe palm branches were to the Jewish people what maple leaves are to Canadians, what eagles are uh, to Americans. It, it's the symbol of, of national uh, patriotic uh, pride. And so they took these uh, palm branches and they laid them down in front of Jesus as he walked and then rode. Notice it says that they came out to meet him, uh, crying out. Some of your translations might have their shouting. You know when a crowd gets shouting one thing? What they were shouting was, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes! In the name of the Lord, over and over, Hosanna, Hosanna. And, and uh, so um, I don't want to miss our Palm Sunday chance here, so that's why I have. Come on, let's sing this. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. I bet they were standing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with our hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O oh Lord, my God. Hosanna in the high. All right, now come on. Now you're familiar with it. Get into this sermon. You're the crowd. Jesus is coming. Hosanna, come on. Hosanna, Hosanna in the high. Hosanna, Hosanna, 
Hosanna in the highest. Sing. Lord, we lift up your name. With our hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord, my God. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Amen. All right, so come on now and take a seat. So they were saying this over and over, crying out, Hosanna. The word Hosanna means uh, save now or Lord save us. And I don't, how many people have ever participated or had one of your kids participate in some Palm, Palm Sunday deal? Go ahead, put up your hand if that's, you know what I'm talking about. I don't want to wreck that, and it's okay that we do that. But... Uh, Serious Bible scholars agree that we have pretty much uh, not understood uh, what was happening here. And if you can picture what's been going on in the past month in the streets of Cairo, Egypt, all right, if you can uh, imagine what it was like uh, to be um, uh, Anne Frank in Amsterdam during the Second World War, when they had to hide to save their lives, and that girl, Anne Frank, if you've ever read her diary, she never saw her 17th birthday. And just as Amsterdam was under the occupying presence of the military Germans bent on taking over the world, Jerusalem was under the occupation of the Romans. And when the crowds gathered and swelled and saw Jesus Christ coming into the city, they made their move. Hey, save now. Come on, we can, we can take over. We can do this. We can push them out. We got the people. We have the power. Let's do this. It was a, it was a political play. They knew from reading the Old Testament that the prophets had promised that the Messiah would be a king and that he would take over. The problem, as I've often taught you, is, is that from the Old Testament perspective, the mountain peaks look like they're together, and what they couldn't see was the valley in between called the church age that we're in, and the first and second advent of Christ was not apparent. And yes, someday Jesus Christ is going to come back and ride a horse and vanquish his enemies with a sword coming out of his mouth, Revelation 19. But here in John chapter 12, he was not coming on a horse. In fact, it says in verse 14, Jesus found a young donkey. It's funny, John, he just wants to get to his point. He doesn't give any of the details, but Luke gives all the details because he's a doctor and he's real precise. Do you know that guy who, who, when he tells you about a movie, it takes him longer to tell you about the movie than it takes to watch it? How many people know that guy? Yeah, if you're that guy, let's, um, let's hang out sometime. <laughs> you know, that on and the detail. So, so we actually know from the other gospels that Jesus sent the disciples in to find a man and to say to the man, the Lord has need of this and to bring the donkey. And if he, if he asks you, what are you taking the donkey for? Say, well, it's for the Lord. And so we don't, John doesn't tell us about that whole part. He's just like, Jesus was ah, a donkey. He found a donkey. Well, there's more to it than that, but it's not said here. What, he, what, what John emphasizes is not how they got the donkey, but the fact that the prophets had actually said that it would be like this. And uh, if you look here in uh, Mark, come and look at this. Come here. This is, check this out. This is from actually Zechariah. Just look here. Just come on, look here. In, in uh, Zechariah, it says chapter 9, see verse... Nine, this was prophesying Jesus. See, I wrote a, a red J in my Bible there because whenever I'm in the Old Testament, there's something about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I always kind of mark that in my Bible that way. But Zechariah prophesied, Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. He's humble and mounted on a, what's it say? Donkey. Mounted on a donkey. And so this thing, this was actually prophesied uh, in the Old Testament that that's how Jesus would come. Why? Because 
a donkey. See, if you're going to war, you come on a horse like he will in Revelation 19. But he's not going to a war against his enemies. He's going to a cross for his friends. This isn't a power move. This is a humility move. And so he gets on a donkey. Have you ever ridden a donkey? Uh, not great is what I would say. If you're a tall guy, your feet are dragging on the ground. I think I'll just walk. And, and so it's a statement of peace, not war. It's a statement of humility, not kingship. In fact, one of the things that they used to mock about Christianity, here's a picture of a tapestry uh, from the third century. You can't see it in that uh, ancient tapestry, but here's a sketch that outlines what isn't apparent. It's actually a picture of people bowing before a slave on a cross with a donkey head. And that's how they mocked you. Really? That's your king riding a donkey? Are you kidding me? Not sure that we've fully understood this triumphal entry. The people were going for a political revolution. Jesus wasn't making a king play here. He, he gets on a donkey and rides it into town. All right, so John 12 then. Jesus found a young donkey, and then the quote from Zechariah, verse 16. Under, of course, his, see it there, John 12, 16. His disciples did not understand these things. And he, you're going to ride, you're going to ride a what? They didn't understand it first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Now, that's a really great point. When did they figure it out? Turn to your neighbor and say, after. Now, now, listen, loved ones. Isn't it true that most times we only really see what God was doing? Say it. When do we see? Tell me. After. It's after that you see it. It's not when it's happening. It's always when you're looking back, you see like, ah, oh, ah, oh, now I get it. Now I see what God was doing because when that was happening... Man, that was hard. That was hurtful. In it, we don't see it. It's always, say it again. It's after that we, in fact, I hope this will encourage you. I'm real thankful to be in church today. And I'm not at a place, honestly, where I'm in the middle of something. But I'll tell you, I've stood in this pulpit a lot of times where I was in the middle of something. And I'm just like, what is God doing and if that's where you are today, just I jot this down. When it hurts uh, most, it's also hardest to see his hand. I think we should just acknowledge that together. Just like disciples couldn't figure out, what's he, what's he, why is he? Only when they looked back did it make sense to them. I, I just was praying uh, that, that this would be a word for somebody who's, you're actually in that place right now, you know? And you're like, God, what on earth? Are you doing? And, and uh, somebody encouraged me recently to go back and, and read the life of Joseph. So I did. Man, there's a guy who didn't see it till afterwards, right? And God gives him this big vision for his life. And uh, he goes to tell his brothers about, you know, some great things that are going to happen. And uh, his brothers were like, um, yeah, we're going to uh, strip you naked and throw you in a pit. That's what his brothers did. They did that to Joseph. God's man. They stripped him naked and threw him in a pit. I mean, if you could have been like Geraldo and jumped down in the pit with a microphone. Hey, hey, how, how's it going right now with, uh, how, how's God working out this thing? I think Joseph would have been, um, you know, I can't really see it right now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting him for it, but I mean, I couldn't point to a lot around here and say great things were in store. And if you could have jumped out of the pit and followed him, when his brother, his older brother, took him and sold him on a caravan uh, as a slave into Egypt. So, so Joseph, how, how's your big God dream going right now? Well, it looks like I'm going to have to be a slave for a while. 
And then when he gets there, it wasn't exactly big time. He ends up in that, if you read all this in Genesis, you should go read this. This is cool stuff. You should read the whole Bible. A lot of it's pretty awesome. Anyone want to say amen to that? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You should probably read the Bible. A lot of it's pretty awesome. So anyway, so in Genesis, Joseph, he ends up down at that lady's house, Potiphar's wife. She, you know, comes on to him, and he's like, I don't think so. And she's like, oh, yeah. He's like, nope. So she gets all offended and falsely accuses him. Of course, that doesn't come up in court when he's found guilty and thrown into prison. And uh, I'm sure if you could have jumped into a cell there with your microphone. How's it going today? You thought it was bad being in that pit. You thought it was bad being a slave at Potiphar's house. How's prison working for you? And then he helps some other people get out of prison, but he doesn't get out. And he's forgotten there for a long time. I guess what I'm trying to say is when he eventually ends up in the palace and gets exalted and his brothers come and bow down before him just like God had told him. I mean, it's a pretty amazing thing comes out of Joseph's mouth at the end of that story. He looks right into the face of his brothers and he says, do you know this part? He says, you meant it. His brothers thought that he was going to kill them. He's like, no, I'm not going to kill you. He says, you meant it for evil, but, right, come on. God meant it for good. God meant it for good. God was, you thought you were going to destroy something. God was building something. You thought you were going to tear something down. God was raising something up. You thought that you were seeing the end of me. God said, you're on the path I want you for. Even if you can't see it, something awesome's ahead. And he spoke those incredible words that he couldn't possibly have known along the way that you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so I just want to say to our family today, I just hope this is for somebody when it hurts the most, it's also hardest to see his hand. You don't have to be able to know in the middle of it why. It's later. Turn to your neighbor and say, looking back. Right? When you're looking back, that's when you... Anyway, I, uh, I got so much out of that verse. That's kind of why we have a part two here, because I just couldn't skip over this stuff. Verse 17, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet uh, him was that they heard that he had done this sign. You know, there's no marketing like a satisfied customer. And so here comes all these people, do it again, do it again. Verse 19, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. I got a happy face in my margin there. I always love it when the, when the Pharisees are freaking out. And it's not really clear in the text who's talking. It's like they were saying to each other, you see that you're gaining nothing, don't you? Come on, come on, we'll act this out. So we're the religious leaders, right? You see that you're gaining nothing, don't you? And they said the same thing back to him, come on. Yeah, well, you're not gaining nothing either. You see that, don't you? Doesn't matter what we do here, it's just get worse. Because it's a God thing. You're not going to get in the way of a God thing. And, and so everything they tried just made the crowds run after Jesus more. But they're not just jealous. The people are very fickle. And these same people that are shouting Hosanna are going to be shouting crucify him in about 10 minutes. So verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. Which wouldn't seem like an especially helpful piece of information. Except that Greeks is a term for Gentiles, non-Jews, and John is making the point that this gospel of Jesus Christ isn't just for Jewish people. It's going to go everywhere. And he's hinting at what will become very clear in the book of Acts through converted Saul who goes to the Greeks and everyone in Asia Minor. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's how we got here. So this, you're actually showing up in the story now. These are our people. The Gentiles that are, are coming, and, and notice what they say. I just love this. So these Greeks, they, they came to Philip. They probably came to Philip because Philip is a Greek name, and Bethsaida had a very high uh, Gentile population. Uh, possibly Philip spoke their language. So they came to Philip 
uh, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. And they asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. I'm going to have to preach on that for a minute. (laughs) Underline that in your Bible. That is one of the best summaries of a heart of a true Christ follower. We want to see Jesus. That's what we want. And could I just say that that should be the heart of it? I pray that for every person in our church. That's why we come to church. We don't need to see no worship team. We don't need to hear some preacher up front. It doesn't even matter who's up front. The reason why we're here is because we want to see Jesus. We want to see him more clearly. We want to follow him more closely. We want to understand him more deeply. We're here for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Say that. We're here for Jesus. Say it. We want to see Jesus. That's what we really want. And I would suggest to you that that kind of focus in your Christian life, eyes on the Lord, eyes on Jesus, that's going to help you a lot. In fact, I just made a little list uh, here. Um, Eyes on Jesus is a protection against uh, at least three things. Here's the first one. Eyes on Jesus is a protection against Uh, religious observance. Going through the motions while the Pharisees were trying to control their religious organization, these Gentiles were like, we just want to see Jesus. Now that's kind of stunning when you think about his resume. They could have come and said, we heard he makes bread. (laughs) They could have come and said, um, we, we, we want him to make the blind, we got this blind lady, we got our, 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 our lame friend who can't walk, we, we, got, we brought our, someone who's dead, and we, we want him to raise, nothing like that. They didn't want the miracle. They wanted the miracle worker. We want Jesus. We want to see Jesus. What an awesome protection. I pray that for you. I pray that when you pull into the parking lot on one of our campuses, that you don't want to attend harvest, that you don't want to hear a sermon, that you don't even want to listen to and participate with the worship team or serve somewhere here, that first and foremost, what we really want is to see Jesus, to see him exalted, to see him recognized and raised up before our eyes for how awesome he really is. I was with, uh, Pastor Rick and I were with some of the elders and their wives recently, and I was so blessed by one of our elders' wives. She just said, you know what I really want in our church? She, I said, what? She said, I want, sir, we wish to see Jesus. That's what she said. I thought to myself, boy, she gets it. She really gets I forgot that that was coming in the passage. I thought of her saying that when I came to this. And uh, here's a second thing. Eyes on Jesus is a protection against religious observance, just going through the motions, just coming to church. It's a protection against, jot this down, human disappointment. And, you know, frankly, we're all so disappointing. And I mean, I, and I love you. I mean, my life is the people in this church. But we're just disappointing. And the longer we're here, the more we're going to disappoint each other. And, 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 uh, but, you know, if you could go find people, maybe you know some people like this, call them today. Go find somebody who doesn't follow Jesus anymore. How many people know somebody who's not following Jesus anymore? And they're just, they don't go to church, they don't read their Bible, they, don't, they, don't, they used to love the Lord, but they're not following him now. And when you talk to them and you ask them, why don't you follow Jesus anymore? Um... Hashtag, you will never hear. Okay, this is what you will never hear. They will never say, well, you know, the more I got to know Jesus, the more I, the, honestly, the less I thought of him. Hashtag, this you will never hear. They won't say, well, you know, um, the more that I, I, I got to know the Lord and walked with him, I just, he just disappointed me. And people aren't disappointed with Jesus. Trust me on this. They're disappointed with each other. And, and uh, that's why um, in John 21, and, and we will get there someday. In, in John 21, Jesus tells Peter that he's going to have to give his life. He's going to have to die in the end. And Peter looks over at John, who always seemed to have the best seat at the banquet. And he's like, well, what about him? 
Jesus said, what is that to you? You follow me. See, that's so awesome. You just get your eyes off of people and get your eyes on the Lord. And, and I'm telling you this, sir, we wish to see Jesus is a great protection against religious observance, against human disappointment, and then against this, uh, thirdly, against a fear in the storm. Uh, a protection against fear in the storm. Remember the time when Jesus told the disciples to go on ahead? And he kind of hung back and prayed for a while. And then, because I've been on the Sea of Galilee, and there's these massive hills on all sides and this small lake. And, and, and uh, the wind howls and the storm comes up. And so Jesus comes to the disciples in the boat. They're freaking out. He comes walking on the water, you know. Walking right out to meet them. You know, they think it's a ghost. They just, but Peter, love this guy. Peter's like, I want to do that. Jesus is like, come on. So he gets, puts his foot over the side of the boat. And he starts walking out to Jesus. He's like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Until what? He start, takes his eyes off Jesus. He starts to look at the wind and the waves. Everybody point to where does he go? He goes down. And maybe that's been your week, man. You got your eyes off of Jesus. This is just, I should have made this the whole sermon. <laughs> but... Haven't even got to the counterintuitive lessons yet. This is just the context. But we're there now. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, verse 22. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them. Here it is. Jesus answered them. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, if you've been coming to church every week... You <laughs> You know that is a pretty huge deal that Jesus is saying this. Let me just review really quickly. In chapter 2, um, Jesus said this to his mother. What does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Then we also studied in chapter 4 when he talked to the woman at the well. Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this. He's like, there's an hour coming. It's not now, but it's coming. The hour is coming. Then in chapter 5, verse 28, he says, don't marvel about this. Don't, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tomb will hear his voice. Wow, it's coming. The hour is coming. And then in chapter 7, verse 30, so they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his, uh, his hour had not yet come. And then in chapter 8, verse 20, it says, These words he spoke, Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. And then I could give more examples, but if you get that, you kind of get the significance of chapter 12, verse 23. Now he says it. The hour has come. You know, it's like, Doo -doo. I can't make a trumpet very good, so I'm not going to try to make a good trumpet. I should have brought a trumpet sound effect like the Calvary, you know. When you, it's like, the hour has come, charge! It's like, game on now. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Full God-man on display starts now. Here comes counterintuitive lesson number one. I mentioned it already, die to live. Verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And so you think of a, there's a sheave of wheat, I guess, and, and a specific stalk and the grain. I could put this on the shelf in my office. I could put this under a heat lamp. It would just get drier and drier, and drier. In order for it to burst into life and multiply and bear fruit, it actually has to go into the ground and rot in the dirt, and out of that death comes life. It's an amazing thing. And, and I want you to understand fruit here. I don't like to use terms in church. We have so many new believers in our church. Everyone say, praise God. That I, I don't want to 
just say things and expect that everyone knows what it is. The Bible uses the term fruit to describe uh, what a Christian life evidences. And just like there's apples on apple trees and oranges on orange trees and pears on pear trees, there is fruit on, on Christians. Christians bear fruit. If you don't bear, Jesus said, by their fruits you'll know them. No fruit, no root. No fruit, not saved. Okay? A lot of people think they're saved. Jesus says, many people say, I did all this stuff for you. And he's going to be like, I didn't even know you. Fruit's a big deal. Okay? But it's not about bushels of stuff and counting and, and vitamin C. It's about things that happen in the life of a Christian. Uh, jot these down. Number one, the fruit of people I won to Christ. Paul says in Romans 1.13, I often plan to come to you so that I might have some fruit among you. Paul said, I'm going to come there. I'm going to uh, preach the gospel. We're going to plant a church. And, and Paul wanted to go to Rome because he knew if he got to Rome through his life, some people were going to come to Christ. Question, how many people are following Christ in the world today because you're following Christ? See, that's, that's a fruit. It's an evidence. Are there people following Christ now because you are? Second a fruit, uh, Romans 6, 22, the fruit of holy living. Now having been set free from sin, you have fruit to holiness. Fruit to holiness. Is there a growing pattern of holiness in your life? More like Jesus, less like the world. More like Jesus, less like self. That's an evidence or a fruit. Here's a third one, the fruit of good deeds, Colossians 1.10. That you may have a walk worthy of the Lord, pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work. Acts of kindness, acts of forgiveness, acts of service. These are fruits. It's what Christians do. If you're selfish and self-centered and have no others focused to your life, that's not a good sign. There needs to be fruit, and then the fruit of character, a growing character. Galatians chapter 5 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Now, against such there is no law. And a growing pattern of those things is if you planted something and there was no apples, you'd be like, I don't think that's an apple tree. And if a Christian says that they're rooted in Christ but there's no fruit, so the fruit of character. And lastly, the fruit of praise to God. Hebrews 13, 15 says, let us continually offer unto God the sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips, giving thanks to his name. And a growing desire and delight in the worship of the Lord, both personally and us together. And a joy in that and a desire to participate in that. How many people can remember a time when you came to church and you saw people worshiping and you're like, I don't get it. Put up your hand if you can remember I don't get it days. Come on, put up your hand high, let other people see you. Remember, I remember my I don't get it days. All right, But you get it now? It gets like way different, right? That's a fruit. That's a fruit. Now, boy, I'm so into it. I used to think they were a little nutty, but now I kind of really can't wait for that. And Okay, so that's what he means when he says, if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Who, you're like, this is going to be great. Finally, something I can do. I'm so good at losing stuff. Okay, this isn't about losing your keys and your phone, okay? This is about losing something that actually is really hard to lose, not easy to lose. This is about losing your life or, or yourself. Whoever loves his life loses it. So how are you doing in that? Losing yourself. How are you doing at losing your ego? How are you doing at losing your self-importance? You're, you're my way. How are you doing at letting go of your reputation and your preferences and being right and needing to win and needing to have the last word? One of my little, I told you a story earlier about somebody who expressed a lot of jealousy toward me. Let, let me use my 
self as a negative example. And there's a person that I care about very much, um, but uh, for years now, uh, this person uh, won't talk to me, won't answer me, won't respond to me. I, um, I've, I've done a lot for this person, but uh, there came a time where there was a difference of opinion, and you know, I'm, I'm actually wrong pretty often, but in this instance, it wasn't that I was wrong. Um, it was that I had to have the final word um, because I wasn't wrong. And I couldn't leave it alone. And with surgical precision, I exposed to this person their folly. I mean, like, like that. Just put it right there. And uh, I had to be right. I had to win. I had to have the last word. And... Uh, let me just say that it, it was not worth it. And I have uh, really painfully had to learn uh, the lesson that that still isn't right. I don't know when it will be. Um, but I've taught this to you before and it comes up here. This is a good example of losing yourself. Um, if you're wrong in the way that you're right, you're wrong even if you're right. That's just hard to learn. It's hard to learn. And I, I, I share myself as an example because maybe you can think of somebody that, um, you know, isn't talking to you right now. And maybe you were right, but maybe you were wrong in the way you were right. And maybe you need to go out of church today and make a phone call. Maybe you need to uh, call your sister. Maybe you've been estranged from your, one of your parents or something. And, and God's taught you a lot. And you need to get them current on what God's doing in your life now. And even if they don't answer you back, and even if they don't respond the way that you want to, you've got to leave that alone like you should have in the first place. Just, just, just leave it and learn from it. And it's an awesome thing that Jesus is teaching here. He's teaching about this, this thing called a self. C.S. Lewis said, oh, to be free from myself. It has, only, it has only made me restless and miserable, myself, and my shortness, and my uh, uh, need to. So you, you think about yourself and how filled with self we are, and, and uh, you're driving along in traffic, and, and uh, someone cuts you off, and, and out comes, hey, 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 and, and you, all the self comes out. Because you're full of it. We're full of it. And why are you yelling at that person? Well, because I, I, don't, I don't even know them, but I'm sure they're not supposed to be in front of me, delaying me from getting where I'm going because I'm important. <laughs> and someone hurts one of your kids. You march over to that school and you set them straight. <laughs> and out comes yourself. And someone says some things to you, someone falsely accuses you or attacks you, and you, you I'm going to set the record straight, I'm going to say what's true. <laughs> See, when you get bumped, you spill what you're full of. And what Jesus is saying is, is if you could get all of this out of you and get filled up with me instead. And, and when something's said about you that isn't true, you want to go after that reviler. But Jesus, it says in Hebrews 12, that when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. That he kept on entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And uh, less of self, more of Jesus. Amen? Amen? And to be filled up with him. And so that when I get bumped, when you get bumped, we don't spill ugly, messy, awful self. We spill Jesus and the fragrance of Christ fills the room 
Boy, talk about finding your life, right? Oh, that sounds so good. And Jesus is like, lose yourself and you'll find everything that you've been looking for and longing for. God help us. And then this. If anyone serves me, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life, you're like, I'm really good at that. I've hated myself for a long time. No, it's not that self-pity, hating yourself, which is just another form of pride. It's not that. It's that, it, that your life isn't worth anything to you. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And to anyone who serves me, he must follow me. Imitate Jesus. Follow Jesus. And the result is, first, intimacy. Where I am, there will my servant be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. God will see your selfless service. God will grant to you intimacy or proximity to Jesus. And God will grant to you honor at the proper time. You know, could you do this for me? Could you not even close your Bible, but just bow your head? And if the people ready to serve in communion could come quietly to the front, I just want to encourage you just to look in your own heart. It won't advantage you greatly to learn about the things that God is extracting from my flesh. But I pray that it helps you to see the self in you and the damage that it does and the Jesus that is lost because self is seen instead and the misery that produces. We're going to take some time and remember the Lord now. And as the elements come to you, if you're a follower of Jesus, please take them. We don't do penance. We do remembrance. And if you're grieved by your failure, get hold of those elements. And let the finished work of Christ flow grace over sin. And let's begin again to live like our Savior. As the elements are passed, Andy's just going to sing this song over us. You continue praying.